and lateral to IC. And then, of course, we need to pay attention to the protrusive range of movement of the mandible from IC or centric occlusion anteriorly. Again, the criteria for an optimal occlusion is three things. Number one, stability in centric. That is, at RC and IC, the forces of mastication are directed axially. Number two, with the teeth together, the patient should be able to have smooth, unimpeded, multi-directional mandibular movements with the maxillary and mandibular teeth together. And number three, and most important of all, the patient needs to be able to experience comfort of the masticatory system, and the masticatory system should be healthy. In this regard, let me say that whenever you do a restoration for a patient, the occlusion, if it is done properly, will be comfortable. There is no reason why an inlay, a crown, a bridge, or what have you should be put in temporarily, hoping that the patient will become accustomed to it and become comfortable. If the patient is not comfortable with a restoration, this should be a sign to you that the occlusion has not been done properly. Now, when we start talking about how to do um, good occlusion in restorative dentistry. The first criteria, again, is stability in centric with the centric force forces directed axially. So again, if you will think back to earlier modules on this, uh, the work by Dempster Adams et al. show that different teeth in the maxilla have different incline or axial inclinations of the teeth from the anterior teeth to the posterior teeth in a frontal view or from a mid-sagittal view that these teeth also have different inclinations. This now becomes important in exactly where you place your centric relation and centric occlusion contacts upon individual teeth. And in the mandible, of course, the same thing occurs. In the mandible, as we go more, more posteriorly, uh, we have more of a lingual inclination to the posterior teeth. We'll have a slide in a moment that will demonstrate and graphically uh, bring out the point that you need to pay attention to this at all times. We have what we call <clears throat> the line of the supporting cusps. In the maxilla, the, again, the maxillary lingual cusps are the supporting cusps or the centric maintaining cusps. And again, depending on exactly the size and the shape of the dentition or the arch, and whether or not teeth have been extracted and not replaced, uh, the centric stops on individual cusps may vary somewhat along the line of the central groove on the mandibular teeth. Conversely, the mandibular buccal cusps are the supporting centric cusps, and of course they should land someplace in the line of the central groove of the maxillary teeth. To put these both together on a Columbia Deniform system and to almost close them together, you can see that these are the regions where we wish to have our centric relation and centric occlusion uh, contacts. You will note here that at no time do we see any centric stops on inclined planes, either on the upper or the lower teeth. Centric relation and centric occlusion contacts should be somewhere on cusp tips, somewhere in the line of the central groove. If you'll remember back earlier in your dental curriculum, you had the cusp coloring exercise, which on standard Columbia dentiform models gave you an idea where in an ideal arch and complete dentition the cusps should land in the opposing line of the central groove. This is the idealized form and is quite important for you to remember now. Fully well realizing that in the clinic, in any given patient, you may never see a, an ideal occlusion like this. But this is what we use as a model, so to speak, to plan our individual patient occlusion according to this sort of a scheme with modifications as necessary. Now then, in everyday restorative dentistry, how do we obtain our number one criteria, and that is stability and centric? Well, again, you've seen this slide before, but the principles now are quite important clinically. We wish to have the resultant vectors of forces to be in an axial direction, up and down the roots of the teeth. There are primarily two ways of doing it. The way is diagrammed on the right side shows incline plane against incline plane. This is the normal way in which newly erupted, non-carious and non-restored teeth will come together. Again, 
there are certain clinical techniques whereby you can duplicate this particular procedure. However, in clinical terms, in practical terms, it is much easier to do it this way, the cusp tip in fossa type of arrangement. Much, much easier to get this. Again, on anterior teeth, if you have very little over jet, if the lower anterior teeth are contacting <clears throat> the maxillary lingual aspect, you can end up with undesirable forces um, making mobility of the anterior teeth. In such a case, you would wish to incorporate a small syndulum in any sort of a crown preparation. This would be called a panky man scouter, uh, after the gentleman who devised this technique, a panky man scouter long centric syndulum. The idea of this is that in IC or RC that the forces are vectored in an axial direction. <clears throat> now then, if we look at the at a buccal lingual view of molar teeth coming together, we now see that each and every aspect of each tooth is important. The centric maintaining cusp in ordinary term in ordinary occlusions would be your maxillary lingual cusp and your mandibular buccal cusp. Again, if these teeth were in crossbite, <clears throat> for instance, if the mandibular tooth was moved to the buccal one whole cusp, you would now see that it would be the maxillary buccal cusp which would land in the central groove, and then the maxillary buccal cusp would become a centric maintaining cusp. And at the same time, your mandibular lingual cusp would now be contacting in the central groove. The main point to remember here is that the principles of good occlusion are what are important. When you run into individual patient variations, such as explained here, one tooth and crossbite, the principles remain the same, well, the individual cuspal anatomy may be altered to fulfill that criteria. And of course, here in the normal alignment, we have the bull cusp on the maxillary buccal and the mandibular lingual. We have our outer inclines and our inner inclines. Again, keep in mind at all times that we wish to get occlusion in our dental restorations to fit into the envelope of function of the mandible in relationship to the maxilla. In most cases, this is intra-border movements, the exception being the retrusive or posterior movement of the mandible back to centric relation, or RC, during the act of swallowing. Again, the concept of good occlusion and restorative dentistry is to think at all times in terms of a mortar pestle arrangement, in this case the mandibular buccal centric stop, having a small area, both an anterior posterior as well as lateral to buccal and lingual area to move around. This again, the concept is called freedom in centric. And I think you now understand that each and every restoration needs to be checked for occlusion not only at centric relation, but at centric occlusion and the two points in between. Therefore, each and every time you do a restoration which involves the occlusal surface, you do need to check centric relation. We now come <clears throat> to some of the important things uh, clinically. This particular phenomenon happens to be called the diagonal law of Telemann. This was named after Professor Telemann, a professor of prosthetics and crown and bridge in Berlin uh, in the 20s and the 30s. Basically, the diagonal law of Telemann means this. That is, that when you notice an, an anterior segment of maxillary teeth beginning to elongate and to extrude, causing spacing or diastema to form between the centrals, the central lateral and or lateral cuspid, and when you see this kind of a phenomenon and you then have the patient tap his teeth together at IC or centric occlusion, you will notice that these teeth are being traumatized and will be moving back and forth in a labial lingual direction as the patient closes his teeth together. Well, <clears throat> most times a dentist who notices something like this or a patient who comes in complaining of sore teeth in this area, until Telemann brought this to our attention, the usual form of treatment was to grind either on the incisal edge of the mandibular anterior teeth which contacted here, or to reduce the lingual aspect of the maxillary anterior teeth. This was the prescribed treatment. However, it was found through the hard knocks of clinical experience that this really did not do the patient much good, because within a little bit of time, the lower 
anterior teeth would extrude, the teeth would come back into contact, and this would be a self-perpetuating cycle. Well, Tillman's Diagonal Law simply says that before you grind in this area here, when you see such a situation, you should look diagonally opposite in the mouth for a centric relation prematurity. In our terminology, this would be an RCIC shift, as illustrated here. In other words, when the mandible is retreated to centric relation in function, this would be during the act of swallowing, you hit prematurely in this area, the mandible would slide forwards, upwards, and off to one side with a net result that the mandibular anterior teeth will be traumatizing the maxillary anterior teeth. The mandibular anterior teeth, because it's a self-contained arch and the forces are directed on the mandibular teeth primarily in a lingual or posterior direction, because of that, the mandibular teeth are not affected. The maxillary teeth are affected. A prime example of that can be seen here. This is a picture 20 years uh, previous to the patient showing up in the clinic. You see that this young lady has a very pretty smile. 20 years later, she has rather advanced periodontal disease, spreading and migration of anterior teeth. A classic example of the Telemann's diagonal law and how this helps to aggravate uh, an existing condition of periodontal disease. The patient does have periodontitis and a reduced amount of alveolar bone support. Whenever she would tap together at IC, this tooth and this tooth would literally move a few millimeters to the labial. She had, as you can probably see in here, she had been ground on on the lower incisors by previous dentists. The amount of her relief, the length of time of her relief, was directly related to how much the dentist ground on these teeth. She obviously had an RC prematurity back on the right side, which caused a three-dimensional RCIC shift forwards, upwards, and off to this side. By relieving this back here, the pressure on these teeth was relieved, and this stopped the further migration of the teeth anteriorly. Now, the number one thing that would cause this sort of a thing is a maxillary supra-erupted unopposed third molar. It could be a second molar or a first molar. So in terms of occlusion in everyday clinical restorative dentistry, the number one thing which you should do is to eliminate unopposed supra-erupting maxillary teeth. Again, this is the third molar illustrated here. It is the percentage-wise the number one thing that you see most frequently, but again, it could be anywhere in the arch. And also, you could have a completely integral arch with no supra-erupted tooth, in which case you can still have a Telemann's diagonal loss simply from a functional malocclusion and prematurities on these teeth as they intercuspate one with another. Now then, <clears throat> we now have to address ourselves in occlusion as to how we would take care of excessive forces on these anterior teeth. When the patient bites together, there's very little uh, overjet or you might say horizontal overlap, resulting in a migration or a traumata traumatism of the maxillary anterior teeth. Before you consider grinding on these teeth, the very first thing to keep in mind at all times is the diagonal law of Telemann. Get the patient's mandible back to the hinge axis, of closure, gently close the patient's mandible, see if there's a unilateral centric relation contact, observe the nature and the direction of the RCIC shift. Usually at the end of the RCIC shift, this is when these particular teeth are traumatized. Again, the first thing to do is not to grind here, but keep in mind Telemann's diagonal law, evaluate and eliminate the posterior prematurities either by extraction or by occlusal adjustment. And then, if you still have traumatism to the anterior teeth, then you come forwards and do this, as has been discussed before. You first mark the teeth with red paper like so, and then you would reshape the labial aspect of the mandibular anterior teeth. The idea in mind being that you will end up with this at IC and at RC, that the contact on anterior teeth would be on the mandibular incisal edge thus resulting in a vectoring of the forces down the root of these teeth. You would then go back and remark this area with red articulating paper again. Still, the, upper, the maxillary anterior would be traumatized because it is on a lingual inclined plane. At this time, then you take an inverted cone type of stone, green stone, green, uh, white stone, or diamond stone, 
and then make a small niche in this area so that the resultant vector of forces will be directed more like this. This is how you do it once you have ruled out any diagonal law of Telemann phenomenon. In a patient who has had um, extensive extraction of posterior teeth and has not elected to have these posterior teeth replaced, you end up with an anterior displacement of the mandible in an attempt to find a stable intercuspal position. As this happens and the mandible moves forwards and upwards, the lower anterior teeth will strike the maxillary anterior teeth. Eventually, these maxillary anterior teeth being traumatized in a non-axial direction will begin to give way. They will begin to flare labially. As this happens, you then begin to get a collapsing of the bite. In an attempt to get more teeth contacting in the intercuspal position, the mandible will be repositioned even more forwards. You'll have less contact here. For a while, you'll have more contact here. Then eventually, these teeth will spread further and you have what we call a progressive collapse of the bite with a flaring of the anterior teeth. The treatment in this case is to reestablish solid posterior uh, occlusal support, be it either with fixed bridge work, removable partial dentures, or any combination thereof. Now, once in a long while, perhaps one out of a thousand cases, you may find a posterior displacement of the mandible under similar circumstances. As illustrated here, this would be an orthodontic classification, an angles class two, division two type of case, where there is very little anterior freedom of the mandible to move forwards. And it is possible that through extensive extractions of teeth, you can get a posterior displacement. Possible theoretically, but clinically highly improbable, but something that you need to keep in mind at all times. Now, the next thing that we need to keep in mind in occlusion, in everyday dentistry and in restorative dentistry, would be the direct opposite of what we just discussed. In this case, we need to pay attention to supra-erupted, unopposed mandibular teeth, primarily mandibular third molars. These particular teeth, or inclined planes, will affect and alter the protrusive range of movement of the mandible, and at the same time will cause a downwards displacement of the condyle, which can and often does lead to either myofascial problems or to uh, strictly intracapsular TM joint problems. This photograph is taken right out of the textbook. What it illustrates here is the incisal or downward growth of a few select teeth. The primary reason for this being a maxillary, uh, excuse me, a mandibular supra erupted third molar, which would hinder the functional anterior movement of the mandible. To avoid hitting that posterior mandibular third molar, this mandible had to move more to this side as it came forwards. These teeth were still under functional stimuli of the mandibular incisors, and these teeth were not. The lack of stimuli helped to make these teeth extrude until they were in contact. The last thing that you would do in that patient would be to grind those teeth flat until you took care of the posterior aspect of the occlusion. And now we get down to the nitty gritty of everyday clinical dentistry, and that is how to do better occlusion in everyday restorative dentistry. And this is, these this slide and subsequent slides in the series, which you'll see in a moment, are taken from chapter 15 in the textbook, which deals with occlusion in restorative dentistry. Again, the normal stability of unworn teeth will be primarily on inclined planes. Now, the problem that we get into is that if, say, you had a class one or a, a class two MO or an MOD type of restoration, say in the maxilla, and you do good restorative dentistry, but you upset the delicate balance of the inclined planes contacting one against another. This will lead to instability and subsequent drifting and shifting of the teeth. It can be done doing only one restoration or it can be done doing opposing restorations. This, of course, would cause stability twice as fast and twice as much drifting as would one restoration. <laughs> 
Now, what you wish to do in the restore in the restorations, instead of what you saw previously, in this case, you would leave the centric stops on inclines alone, where you do not have to restore uh, tooth structure. In the area where you do need to restore tooth structure by whatever material you deem necessary, the resultant forces of mastication should be directed axially. Again, the best way to do that, in this case, in your mac maxillary restoration in the upper tooth here, would be to provide occlusal contact such that the lower cusp tip would land in a small level area in the maxillary restoration. And if you had two restoration, the principles are identical. <clears throat> now, one of the things that helps to lead to instability is an overcarving of uh, the occlusal aspect of amalgam restorations. First of all, starting at figure A here, you would have caries in the tooth like so. You do your standard type of caries elimination, your cavity preparation, and then you would fill this cavity, in this case with amalgam, to prevent fracturing of the amalgam. You would overcarve it like so. Now you have instability. You have good contact with the maxillary lingual cusp with a central groove, but you have no contact here. An unstable situation, these teeth, given a little bit of time, will tend to drift and shift so that you end up with this type of an occlusion. This is not very good. For one thing, this could have a wedging action tending to split the tooth somewhere in a mesial distal direction. In addition to this, you have built in here now a balancing interference when the patient's mandible moves to the opposite side. Now, you can take this same criteria and apply this, as shown here, to fixing an occlusion before doing restorative dentistry. In A here, this is centric occlusion, or the intercuspal position before occlusal adjustment. You then do the occlusal adjustment and create in here a small, long centric. B here now is the point of contact at centric relation, or RC, after the occlusal adjustment. And now you wish to do a restoration in this tooth. The dotted line here illustrates the outline of the cavity preparation. And then in your wax up and subsequently in your gold casting, or if it be amalgam, it would be the same thing in your carve up of the amalgam, you have now incorporated in your dental restoration in this one area what we call the long centric or the freedom in centric. Point B being the area of mandibular cusp tip contact in this flat central groove region, point A being the point of contact when the mandible is retruded to the centric relation position. Again, these are the same principles as you use in occlusal adjustment, only in this case you are applying the identical principles to everyday bread and butter restorative dentistry. And again, this illustrates one restoration. If you have 32 restorations in the mouth, the principles are the same. Now, a very important concept, and one in which we will not dwell on at great length, but I'll refer you to the textbook, uh, chapter 15 on this, but we'll discuss it very briefly here. That is, what would you do if you have a patient that needs extensive restorative work? Say, for instance, he needs a mandibular bridge, a maxillary posterior bridge, some inlays, onlays, practically every posterior tooth needs to be replaced. What is the logical, orderly sequence that you should follow to end up not only with good crowns and inlays, but to end up with good functional occlusion, which will fulfill the three criteria for occlusion, as we've discussed many times before? The important step-by-step -step procedures are done for the following reasons. Number one, you need to maintain and to control your centric contacts at point B and at point C, and at the same time, while maintaining these centric stops in a stable axial direction, you also need to shape the inner aspects of the maxillary teeth from A to B and B to C as seen here, and also you need to shape the area C to D on, in the mandible and the area A to B in the mandibular teeth over here. The best way clinical experience has shown through the years, the best way to establish our criteria for a good occlusion is to restore the mandibular teeth first, getting good anatomy to the mandibular teeth, and then subsequently to this to carve and shape 
the maxillary restorations so that they will fit well with the mandibular restorations. Some of the pitfalls you get in if you do it in the reverse would be shown here. For instance, if this were a maxillary uh, pontic or a bridge with a ceramic facing in this region, if you do the maxillary tooth first and then put in the mandibular tooth, it is quite possible that you could end up with a high or, pre or interfering aspect of the maxillary buccal cusp. You realize by this time that to eliminate such a thing, you would have to grind this area according to the bull rule, the buckle of the upper. To do this, according to the dotted line here, it is quite conceivable, and clinical experience has shown this to be so, you may have to grind away so much of the supporting gold cusp area here that you would weaken the support and the protection of the labial ceramic facing to the point that it's quite feasible that the patient could fracture or break off the labial porcelain, which is a rather disastrous uh, happening for both the patient and for you. To repair or replace this is an extremely complicated procedure. This can be avoided almost 100% by building the mandibular teeth, shaping them first, and then shaping the maxillary areas. Again, another reason for doing the mandibular teeth first followed by the maxillary teeth is that we do not want balancing contacts in the natural dentition. The best way to avoid this, to avoid a balancing contact which would have to be ground off and subsequently lose one of our centric stops in this area here. The best way to avoid that again, design and build your mandibular tooth and then build your maxillary tooth to fit it. Again, I refer you to chapter 15 where this has gone into in great detail. This will require a great amount of study on your part to understand completely. Now, the next aspect that we must address ourselves to in restorative dentistry is this. How steep should we make our cusps? Should we have flat, plain cusps in the natural dentition, or should we have moderate or steep cusps? Along with this, we need to ask ourselves, should the central groove region be very narrow, as illustrated here, or should it be rather wide, as illustrated here? These illustrations are taken from... Uh, a chapter of the Dental Clinics of North America, an article that was written by Dr. Clyde Schuyler. And in rather simple terms, he uses a little sports car coming down a hill to illustrate what can happen here. This is a bit oversimplified, but I think it illustrates the point uh, sufficiently. If we have steep cuspal inclines and a very, very narrow, almost non-existent central groove region, this would be quite similar to a sports car racing down a hill and crashing into a wall. This is probably the most traumatogenic type of occlusion which we can have. In this illustration here, if we maintain the same cuspal inclinations but widen out the central groove region, we then have a much less traumatic situation as illustrated here. Now the next thing that you could have, the next alternative perhaps, would be very, very shallow cusps as illustrated here, 15 degree cusps. You could have them either with no central groove region here, which would be slightly traumatic, or the completely atraumatic type would be shallow cusps with wide fossa. This perhaps is the least traumatic way of doing it. However, again, I think that this is a rather oversimplified version of how to restore our cuspal anatomy on posterior teeth, because it does not take into consideration uh, a very vital aspect of mandibular movement, and that is the condylar anatomy, uh, Bennett shift and Bennett movement. This is a photograph taken from the same Dental Clinics of North America article. This one happened to be by Dr. Guichet, and it, we've discussed this somewhat uh, in earlier uh, lectures on occlusion. The important thing to take into consideration at all times is that we don't want balancing interferences. Again, on a panographic tracing, the tracing may show that our patient would move his mandible to the side like so. If we use a semi-adjustable articulator or the old-fashioned barn door hinge snake killer type of articulator where we don't take into account lateral excursions, it is quite possible that our laboratory man would build up the buccal aspect of this lingual cusp to such a degree that we would have an extremely heavy balancing interference in this area.
If insufficient tooth reduction has occurred, initially it is quite possible that in the attempt to eliminate this balancing interference that not only do we eliminate the balance, but right about this point here we would grind through the gold, through the cement, and into the inadequately prepared uh, underlying dentin. For this reason, I think that it behooves us to at least consider the possibility of doing a pantographic tracing. Before we get strictly to the pantographic tracing and the use of a fully adjustable articulator in clinical dentistry, let us very briefly refresh our memories on things we discussed previously, and that is the, the uh, very definite interplay of the anatomy of, the, of our dentition, that is the ridge and groove placements on mandibular and maxillary teeth, and how these ridge and groove placements are very definitely affected and influenced by the condylar anatomy and by the anatomy of the glenoid fossa, or in more simple terms, how the, con the condylar anatomy or the temporomandibular joint anatomy will affect mandibular movement and how this in turn will affect the anatomy of our restorations. Again, keep in mind here the A point A is wide intercondylar distance, C narrow intercondylar distance, and B an intermediate amount. This very definitely, the amount of inter intercondylar distance will affect the ridge and groove placement on mandibular and maxillary teeth. Something else we need to keep in mind is the medial wall of the glenoid fossa. If we have an immediate side shift or a delayed side shift or no side shift whatsoever, this again will affect the ridge and groove placements of mandibular and maxillary teeth and it will also affect to some degree the amount of the concavity of maxillary anterior teeth. And something else now, as we look on the working side, and if we see how the lateral lip of the glenoid fossa will affect how the condyle will move when the patient's mandible is moved to the side. Again, it could move lateral and retrusive or straight lateral or lateral and protrusive. This again very definitely has a role to play in how you shape, how you place the ridges and the grooves on posterior teeth and how you shape the anterior teeth. Again, if you look at this in a vertical plane, the working side condyle can come straight out, it can come out and up, or it can come out and down. And this again is a very definite role to play in the steepness of the cusps. On the working side, the steepness of the buccal cusp or the bull cusp. And on the balancing side, even more important, it has a tremendous amount to do with how steep you can make the maxillary lingual cusp on the orbiting or on the balancing side. If, again, if the condyle would move laterally and up in a lateral sertrusion movement, to follow this over here, with this type of a condylar arrangement on the working side, we must have shallower centric maintaining cusps on the balancing side. Again, this is very definitely important in whether or not we should have steep cusps, and I feel this is why a pantographic tracing and a fully adjustable articulator can be quite useful and quite helpful in everyday restorative dentistry. Again, that type of posterior condylar inclination and guidance can have a great deal to do with the lingual anatomy of the anterior teeth. Again, in a uh, vertical plane now, as you look at the balancing side condyle, if you have a great amount of Bennett shift, this will tremendously influence the steepness or the height of the supporting cusp, the maxillary lingual cusp. As you see in this area, if you have uh, an immediate and a tremendous amount of Bennett shift to the side like so, on the balancing condyle, you must make your cusp shallow. If you come out pretty much straight like this, you may, if you wish, get away with steep cuspal anatomy. So, to put this all together in one or two diagrams, a working side condyle can move laterally anywhere in this 60 degree cone of movement. To be able to recognize this and to integrate this with your, the anatomy of your dental restorations should be a very definite criteria to aim for. Very briefly, to review ourselves on this slide from the textbook,
the amount of incisal guidance, the amount of condylar guidance has a tremendous influence and a role in the arc of your curve of speed. Whether you have a steep arc, a shallow arc, like so, these are very definitely interrelated with your incisal guidance and your condylar guidance. And very briefly, to review this slide from chapter four in the textbook, what this illustrates is the importance and the need in everyday restorative dentistry for building your occlusion to a centric relation, which would be at this point in a horizontal tracing, and to make sure that your centric occlusion or the intercuspal position is in the mid-sagittal plane at this point here, rather than off the mid-sagittal plane off to one side. Again, the reasons for this are to prevent myofascial disturbances in the muscles of mastication, and to prevent the um, degeneration of the condyles themselves when the mandible must function at IC off the mid-sagittal plane. Now, probably one of the most iatrogenic things done in everyday restorative dentistry is not to realize the position of centric occlusion in relationship to the mid-sagittal plane. And what this slide illustrates in the accompanying text in chapter four of your textbook is how in insidious manner a dentist can unbeknowing to himself help to reinforce a poor centric occlusion positioned off the mid-sagittal plane with subsequent uh, malpositioning of both condyles. One or two or three everyday routine dental restorations built with tight interlocking occlusion with a mandible off the mid-sagittal plane will not only reinforce but will help to make more solid and subsequent to this potentially more pathogenic and pathologic this type of an occlusal situation. Conversely to this, good occlusion can be designed in restorations to bring a poor centric occlusion off the mid-sagittal plane back into the mid-sagittal plane. And to my mind, this is good preventive uh, restorative dentistry in everyday clinical practice. Again illustrating the purpose and the value of a panographic tracing. And very briefly, the panographic tracings are important to help to trace in three dimensions the condylar movement. Again, as we discussed uh, to some degree previously, at centric relation, you would be able to record on a semi-adjustable articulator point C and a point at a protrusion in here. In a semi-adjustable articulator, you would connect these two with a dotted line, but in reality, the condyle does not move in this manner. Rather, it would come down and up in this manner here. And again, this is the purpose of the pantographic tracing as illustrated here. And again, a pantographic device shown, um, assembled, and taken out of the patient's mouth. The whole idea of this and the tracing plates are to illustrate how the condyles will affect the anatomy of the teeth, which would be illustrated on this horizontal tracing plate and this horizontal tracing plate over here. And you would then take that panographic tracing to your adjustable articulator. Again, the whole purpose of this being uh, superimposed here would be a mandibular molar to give you an idea of the proper ridge and groove placement of these teeth. And again, to illustrate how in the posterior tracing plates, how you can duplicate in a graphic manner the movement of the condyle through the glenoid fossa. And again, as the condyle comes downwards and inwards like this, this gives you a good control of the dental anatomy so that you can get the type of occlusion which we know that patients should have. Very briefly, to illustrate the point, you can make your intraoral clutches and put on your maxillary tracing arm this is the Danar system of doing this with what we call an arbitrary hinge axis location. Very briefly here, an arbitrary hinge axis uh, locating technique is adequate if you do not wish to tamper with the patient's existing vertical dimension. If you wish to open the bite, the arbitrary hinge axis locating technique is a poor one. It can lead to lots of troubles, in which case you would need a dynamic hinge axis locating technique. And this to illustrate another plane of reference, both the upper and the lower clutches in place. 
pantographic uh, tracing device uh, put together, like so. Again, this has gone into in greater detail in uh, other aspects. Well, once you've taken your pantographic tracing, and you are now ready to do your restorative dentistry, say in gold work, you then work with your fully adjustable articulator, and then you see right now we back into the freshman technique of your drip wax uh, additive technique for obtaining good anatomy in your restorations. If you will remember, what you do is you place the cusp tip, which will be the cusp tip, you place your wax cone so that you have freedom of the cusp tips to pass through either the embrasure areas or through the developmental grooves in the teeth. This is done to help develop an atraumatic occlusion. Again, keep in mind the areas of centric occlusion, centric relation contact here. You have prepared the teeth over here and you now in wax wish to shape the teeth so that at centric relation, centric occlusion, you have this type of an occlusal scheme. And you've been through this before as freshmen. At that time, you were doing it to learn dental anatomy and also how to handle wax and numerous other things. But again, the principles are the same now that you are uh, working on patients who have problems. Now, to summarize, what do we wish to have? Ever, don't forget, more than 90% of the patients have two centrics, that is RC and IC. You need to have stable centric contacts cusp tip in fossa arrangement at centric relation and at centric occlusion and at the two positions in between. And you need definitely in each and every restoration, be it a class one, one surface amalgam occlusal restoration or a full mouth rehabilitation, you need to check the occlusion on that restoration at centric relation to make sure that it is not premature at centric relation or at centric occlusion or in between those two positions. Again, keep in mind the concept of the envelope of motion of the mandible in relationship to the maxilla. And within that, the concept, as we understand it today, the envelope of function. And you should build your dental restorations of no matter what size or what number of them to fit the envelope of motion and to fit the envelope of function. Keep in mind again the fact that in early mastication that there's a wide range of function of the mandibular teeth against the maxillary teeth. Later on as the patient is ready to prepare the food for swallowing, the functional area of tooth contact is greatly reduced to an area around centric occlusion, both in an anterior, posterior direction as well as laterally. And so when we get down to this then we think in terms of the concept of freedom in centric, allowing a lower buccal cusp tip to have some freedom in the upper central groove, and vice versa, allowing the maxillary centric stops on the maxillary lingual cusps, an area of freedom in the mandibular central groove region. This again is what we call the more pestle concept, freedom in centric. Now to summarize, you understand the principles of occlusion you understand the physiology of occlusion and how the masticatory system works. You understand all the various things that go wrong in the masticatory system. As far as treatment in everyday restorative dentistry, call it bread and butter dentistry, you should in every restoration fulfill these criteria. Number one, stability and centric with RC and IC forces directed in an axial manner. Number two, the patient with his teeth together should be able to have smooth, unimpeded, multi-directional movements. Any restoration which you put in the mouth should be comfortable, and if it is comfortable and fulfills these other criteria, it will help to promulgate health of the masticatory system.